right, this will be class number eight of our Creation Science Evangelism course number 102. And we are picking up uh, with Darwin when he set sail on board the Beagle in 1831. Lyle's book came out in what year? Who remembers what year from last week? 1830. And Darwin just graduated from Bible college the next year to be a preacher. Darwin has a fascinating history. His great-grandfather was Erasmus Darwin. He was so fat... He was a doctor, medical doctor, but he was so fat they cut the table out for him to be able to sit and eat because he couldn't reach the food otherwise. They had a special table with it cut out for him. His dad was also a doctor, Charles Darwin's dad was, and they had sent Charlie to school to be a doctor, but he just didn't have the stomach for it, you know, the blood and the cutting people open. He just couldn't do it. Charlie Darwin was a, basically a dud at everything he did. He was a loser. He didn't know how to work. He didn't know how to do uh, much of anything. He loved to hunt and shoot birds. He just loved to shoot birds. But he also raised pigeons. Kind of a strange fella. He really enjoyed worms. He loved worms. And that's one of the reasons he hated birds, because birds ate worms. And he thought that was kind of cruel and hard on the worms, so he shot all the birds he could find. The more you read about the guy, the more you wonder how on earth he ever became so famous, because he really was a loser. He was a lousy student. He wasn't good at much of anything. Uh, never showed an interest in hardly anything except sports, playing around. He just didn't do much. But when he uh, dropped out of medical school, uh, they sent him to college to be a preacher. Because in England, if you got to be a pastor of a church, I mean, the Church, uh, the church of England was, and still is, I believe, supported by the government. Tax-supported. So you don't have to work, you don't have to do nothing. You, just, you get your paycheck every week whether you do anything or not. So his idea was, I'm just going to be a country parson you know, and just do nothing the rest of my life. He did like to study. He read a lot. And so when he uh, couldn't find a job after getting out of Bible college, his dad, medical doctor, a very important man in the area, pulled a few strings and got him on board the HMS Beagle. Now, the Beagle was going to sail around for five years and collect information about various continents and animals and plants on different continents, South America particularly. But they were going to go completely around the world. Darwin got a job sailing around on the Beagle, and, of course, it's a five-year voyage. Now, the deal was, you don't get paid anything. Well, we're going to work for five years. You get paid nothing, but we will feed you. His dad said, son, that's the best offer you got. You better take it. So he set sail for five years just so they'd feed him. It was a good chance to grow up, you know, and like guys go off to the military for four years, and they come back, they're, they grow up fast in the military. Well, as Darwin sailed around, he brought some books to read, of course. He brought his Bible. He just got out of Bible college. And he brought a book by Charles Lyell, the principles of geology. Now, you need to understand a little what was going on here. In the 1830s, an awful lot of Christians were teaching a doctrine, and this would be a quiz question. The doctrine was called the fixidity of the species. Fixidity, F-I-X-I, he spelled it, I don't know how to do it. Uh, fixidity of the species. What that means is, they said, if there are 20 different kinds of dogs, well, then God made 20 kinds of dogs, because nothing changes. And if there are animals that are adapted to cold weather, well, God made cold weather animals and God made warm weather animals and nothing ever changes, okay? And if there's a particular kind of bird on a certain kind of island, well, God made it for that island. They didn't, they didn't believe, uh, some, now some, of course, they weren't all like this, but probably the majority opinion in Darwin's day was this doctrine called the fixidity of the species. Darwin, as he sailed around, it became pretty obvious to him, this is simply not true. And he was right. Oftentimes, the Christians teach things that it just, it's not what's in the Bible. And then people rebel against their teaching and think somehow all of Christianity is bad because this false doctrine is bad. <laughs> like the Pharisees. You know, they added to the Word of God so much. And people would, just, they just rebelled against the Pharisees' rules, but it caused them to rebel against God's Word. And that was the mistake. One of the, the for instance, the Sabbath commandment was, do no servile work on the Sabbath. You know, you work like a servant. Don't do that on the Sabbath. God said, I want you to rest. Well, so the Pharisees came along and said, well, let's see, walking more than an eighth of a mile, that's, uh, that's work. If you walk less than an eighth of a mile from your home, that's fine. So they would take a piece from their house, a brick or something. They would walk an eighth of a mile, break off a piece, drop it on the ground, and say, oh, this is now my house. Walk another eighth of a mile, break off a piece, drop it on the ground. <laughs> Look for a loophole to the stupid rule which they made up to begin with. This type of thing is what the Pharisees did, and Jesus really gave the Pharisees a hard time, and he should have. But we got a bunch of Pharisees today, 
doing the very same thing. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians, it's a shame for man to have long hair. That's all it says. And from that, some people say, well, here's how long is long, and they make all these extra rules. Now, just a minute. This is a matter of Christian interpretation. Uh, you, you decide what you think God is happy with. The Bible says women should dress modestly. After that, it's up to you, you know. I think it's your decision as a Christian to decide, you know, how do you think, what do you think pleases God? And if you go beyond that, you quickly become a legalist or a Pharisee. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I keep a nice short haircut because I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I want to, nobody gets, nobody would slam the door at me because of my hair if I was out knocking on doors soul winning. Now, they might not like something else I have or do or say, but, you know, at least the hair won't be an offense to them. So, I, I just think it's, it's not worth the issue. You know, it's not worth fighting about. Um, and many issues are that way. So Darwin, here he was, about to set sail on the Beagle. One of his jobs was to collect bugs and birds uh, for the people back in England who were paying for this trip because they wanted to get a collection of stuffed birds and stuffed bugs or, you know, mount, uh, uh, formaldehyde uh, preserved bugs for their big museum they're building. So some guy paid for this boat to go out for five years. As Darwin is sailing around, he uh, said this book uh, changed his life forever. Charles Lyell's book did. Because in this book, remember, Charles Lyell said the earth is, you know, millions of years old. And each of the layers that you see is a different age. Well, Darwin read that book on the voyage and believed it. Later on, he wrote a letter to one of his friends, uh, Russell Wallace, and he said, This belief crept over me on a very slow rate. I felt no distress. In other words, it didn't bother him that he lost his faith in the Bible. But on that trip, Captain Fitzroy, that'd be another question you need to have on a quiz, Captain Fitzroy, F-I-T-Z-R-O-Y, he was one of those, uh, he was a Christian, but he was one of those Pharisee types who was extremely hard to get along with. And uh, Darwin really defended Christianity against the sailors for most of the voyage. He defended the Bible for the first part of the voyage, and gradually, as he read Lyle's book, it appears that that was the thing that really convinced him against the Bible being literally true. And plus, Fitzroy and Darwin talked m many, many, many hours on this five-year voyage, and Fitzroy was just absolutely inflexible, unreasonable. You couldn't talk to the guy. It's my way or hit the road, you know? And there's, of course, people like that today, plenty mm -hmm. of them. And so that kind of drove Darwin away, uh, from at least from the rigid fundamentalism, and there's no telling how many people have been, and I'm a fundamentalist, okay, but there's no telling how many people have been driv driven away from Christianity by the fundamentalists who got their dumb rules that they did not get from the Bible. Anyway, during this voyage, as they sailed around, they would stop in at all sorts of different ports. On the right side of uh, South America, you can see on the map there, Darwin, as he's coming into this port, he saw this river and this giant valley. And here he is, he just got, he's been reading Lyle's book about how, you know, things take millions of years to happen. And he said, you know, I bet that river slowly moved grain after grain of sand and made that massive canyon. I, mean, I forget which one it was, but it's one of the rivers in South America that really impressed him. Like, this would have taken millions of years. Well, yeah, or it would take one big flood. <laughs> but he assumed the present is the key to the past. And there's the problem. He's looking at this river, moving down this little channel, bringing a few grains of sand at a time. And he's thinking, wow, to make this giant valley would take millions of years. Well, you're right, Charlie. If that river did that, it would take millions of years. But that river didn't do that. And that's exactly where they go wrong. The flood is what they forget. They don't like to talk about that flood. But Darwin came to these islands right here, the Galapagos Islands. And that'll be a quiz question. Galapagos, G-A-L-A-P-O-G-O-S, I believe. On the Galapagos Islands, they found giant tortoises. You ever gone to the, uh, the zoo or the uh, carnival or something, you see those huge turtle tortoises. A turtle lives in the water. A tortoise lives on land. That's the difference, okay? You caught a tortoise the other day, right? They're out here? A box? Uh, yeah, okay. If it's on the tortoise, it lives on, a tortoise lives on land. A turtle lives in the water. Otherwise, they look very, very similar. Uh, the giant Galapagos tortoises, nobody knows for sure how long they live, uh, but they, they, as far as I know, all of them come from originally from Galapagos. They are supposed to be excellent food. The sailors would just pick these things up and take them on board the ship and let them wander around because, you know, what do they move? Five feet an hour. You, know? <laughs> you set them down, you go back to get them three days later, he's only 50 yards away. Uh, and they would eat them. They would just let them, live, li let them live on the ship until they're ready to eat them. Right. 
Yeah. And so they just about wiped him out. Because it was such an, I mean, how hard is it to catch one? <laughs> it's real simple. But picking them up gets to be a problem because they're huge. They know that they live 250 years, and some people suspect they live 400 years, those tortoises. Well, they don't get excited about much, you know, just kind of stay calm. <laughs> Life's nerves don't get rattled very easily. Anyway, that's where these tortoises come from, Galapagos Islands. There are many, many islands to this Galapagos area. Uh, I don't know exactly how many, but there they are some of the major ones right there. And one of them is named Darwin, one is named Wolf, uh, Pinta, and all these different names for these islands. These On these islands, Darwin noticed each of them had a slightly different type of finch. Now, finch is a real tiny little bird. And since Darwin hated birds, he shot all the birds he could find and collected them and stuffed them and mounted them, you know, for the museum. And he noticed that they were all finches, but their beak shapes were different. On some islands, the finches had to live on the ground because there weren't any trees. So if it's a ground-dwelling finch, he noticed it had slightly different feet and slightly different beak for cracking, you know, nuts or something. If it lived in the trees, so he, he divided them up into sections. Those that eat berries, buds, and flowers on the bottom left, that's got a bee by it, comes from island, one of the islands over there. Uh, some that eat insects and flowers, and some that uh, eat fruit and nectar on the Cocos Island. So he divided these birds up, studied them an, an awful lot. He spent a lot of time classifying these birds based upon what they eat, where they live, you know, the available food, the shape of their beak. Now, finch is only this big to begin with. Okay, so we're talking not very much. But after studying all these 14, he finally ended up with 14 varieties of finches. And what happened was the birds would apparently got blown off of South America in a storm because it's quite a ways out to Galapagos. I think 200 miles maybe, I don't know, but it's, it's quite a ways. Apparently, this you know, storm blew them out, and they ended up, a little tiny bird, ends up on the island. Can't get back. So he stays there. And they raise their families. And eventually, those that, if there's only seeds to eat, and it takes a pretty heavy beak to be able to crack the seed, the babies that are born that don't have a heavy beak can't crack the seed. And so they die. Suppose we said, we're going to go through Pensacola and kill everybody who is under six feet tall. Full grown, but under six feet tall. We kill them all. Then we wait about 20 years and do it again. Wait about 20 years and do it again. Eventually, you've got an entire population of people that are over six feet tall. Because the genes for less than six feet are gone. You weeded them out of the population. That's called selective uh, survival. They do that. Dog raisers, uh, breeders do this all the time. It's called selective breeding. If you want a dog with a long, curly hair, well, then you pick out the puppies that have the longest, curliest hair, and you, you only let them crossbreed to, the, you know, to the next one that has the long, curly hair. And eventually, you've got a whole breed of long, curly-haired dogs. Probably nearly all the varieties of dogs we have today came from this process. It's called selective or na artificial selection. Now, natural selection is where nature decides which one survives. In the case of the Galapagos Islands, if there are no trees to live on, then birds that require trees for safety aren't going to survive. Those that can live on the ground and survive against whatever predators are available, they can survive. So yeah, I want you to be able to explain for the quiz the difference between natural selection and artificial selection. Basically, natural selection, nature, through either cold weather or warm weather or some, some natural factor, would influence who survives. And artificial selection is where somebody on the outside, like a human being normally, decides, I'm going to let these survive and breed and these will not survive. Cattle farmers do that all the time. You get a bull or a cow that's a little sickly, where well, you don't want that breeding back into the herd and spreading the, the defect around. So artificial selection is extremely rapid, what you can do. Darwin used artificial selection raising his uh, pigeons. And he got some extremely wild-looking, fancy pigeons. They were still pigeons. But he noticed you could, with artificial selection, you could get some incredible varieties in the pigeon family. Uh, there are probably hundreds of varieties of pigeons. And then Darwin said, well, you know, if I can do this in just my lifetime and can raise all these hundreds of varieties of pigeons, what can nature do for millions of years? Well, nature could probably produce a variety of pigeons too, Charlie. <laughs> but it's still a pigeon. It's still a bird. And somehow he got it into his head on this voyage that if we can see these little variations produced over a short lifespan, what would millions of years do? 
And that's where he went from science into fantasy daydreaming that maybe, maybe this proves the birds and the bananas have a common ancestor. He just went way off, out of, way beyond reality and assuming that this would somehow go farther. If we took all of the rabbits in the world, captured them all, turned them loose in Alaska, the vast majority would freeze the first year, but a few would survive. Those that have the thicker fur would survive, or those that have a bigger body. Up, I was up in uh, Saskatoon, Canada, uh, Saskatchewan, Canada. I was on this plane going up there to preach up in Saskatoon, and the whole plane is full of hunters from Alabama and Texas and Georgia. I mean, I was about the only one that wasn't a hunter on the plane. A bunch, a bunch of rednecks. Was I got talking to the guy next to me. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going up to go deer hunting in, in Saskatchewan. I said, where are you from? He said, Alabama. I said, you got all kinds of deer in Alabama. He said, oh, not as big as they got up here. The deer up in Canada are much bigger than the deer down south here. So they shoot them. All they want is the head. It costs them $5,000 to go in there, shoot the deer. They, they leave the meat for the local Indians. All they get is the head. Which, and then it costs them a couple hundred bucks to get it shipped back to the United States and stuffed and mounted to hang on the wall. But they're, they're huge deer. I don't know the numbers, but I would guess an average deer here in Florida might weigh 80, 100 pounds, 80 or 100 pounds. Average deer up there might weigh 200 pounds. Up in Illinois or Minnesota, the deer are bigger, but not as big as Canadian deer. Now, why would even the crows, if you compare a crow here to the crows you saw in uh, uh, Wyoming, the crows are much bigger. Why is that, you think? Exactly right. Bigger body, they, they can survive the cold better. Smaller crows couldn't survive. Bigger crows can survive colder weather. Eskimos generally are shorter and stockier. Whereas a long, lanky person has more surface area exposed that can't tolerate the, the cold as well. Uh, it's just that, that would be an example of natural selection. However, it's very limited. Natural selection has worked on the rabbit populations to the point where the Alaska rabbits, because the, they've only they got a you know they got a short summer and long winter, they have a certain breeding cycle where they have their babies at a certain time of the year, and if you have the babies too late, they they die. Have them too early, they die. So, down in Florida, they don't have that problem. Florida rabbits and Alaska rabbits cannot interbreed. They're considered a different subspecies. Now, Florida rabbits and Minnesota rabbits can breed just fine. And Minnesota rabbits and Alaska rabbits can breed just fine. They're halfway between. But you now have the two extremes, which are no longer interfertile. And so people will say, see, that's an example of speciation. Okay, well, if you want to call that speciation, then I agree. But the Bible doesn't talk about species. The Bible talks about kinds. And if you would put the Alaska rabbit and the Florida rabbit and the Minnesota rabbit in a cage and bring up all the seven-year-olds in the world and say, what are these? Oh, those are rabbits. <laughs> it's the same kind of animal. I mean, use your head. So do they call that evolution? They'll call that evolution. Do they, I mean, do they say that it's produced a different species? And, and sometimes because who decides what's a species? Yeah. And who's making this decision anyway? Some guy that's desperate for evidence to begin with for evolution, for his make his theory look good. Because with it, you would think, Hey, this can, the one in Florida can breed with the one in Minnesota, so that has to be the same species. Minnesota can breed with the one in Alaska, that has to be the same species. Yeah, that's why they normally call that a subspecies. Yeah, but then you look at a coyote and a wolf, yeah. which are different species, but they, can, yeah. but they can breed. There's a picture on the internet somebody sent me yesterday or a couple days ago about a walpin. They, at a zoo, I think it's the San Diego Zoo where I just was, or maybe the Hawaiian one where we were a couple weeks ago, they crossed a killer whale and a dolphin. Killer whale and a dolphin. Now normally crosses like that end up being sterile. They cannot produce. But this one had a baby of its own. It was not sterile. What did they breed it with? I think with a dolphin. Wow. And what happened? And they got babies uh, from the got babies that would be one quarter killer whale and three quarters dolphin. Gradually it's going to breed back to one or the other. But even still, if you put a killer whale and a dolphin 
side by side, and stand 50 feet away and look at them, they look awful similar. I would say it's a very similar kind of animal. And they might have even had a common ancestor. Somebody, uh, Tino Gropi up in uh, Wisconsin, a uh, good friend of mine, he sent me a whole series of pictures of crosses. He sent me a liger. A lion and a tiger? Lion and a tiger. A lion and a tiger can, can crossbreed and make a liger or a tigon, depending which one is the father. It'll work either way. It looked halfway between the two, yeah. Well, uh, a horse and a jackass will produce a mule, and the mules are almost always male and sterile. One out of 20,000 is a female and is not sterile. But then who do you cross it with? Cross it with a sterile male? What do you, <laughs> what do you get? Nothing. So uh, generally, the... I would say the, the Bible definition of kind, and I was in, I've been in several debates where they really press me, you know, what is a kind, what is a kind? I've decided to go ahead and answer the question, knowing it'll set me up for, you know, as a target. A kind is those that were originally, in the creation, originally able to reproduce. Now, today we might have different species that are from the same kind. They were, they were part of the original breeding stock. I noticed in the last few debates you went ahead and said that. Yeah, than... that's what the Bible says. It, the definition of kind has to do with bring forth, have children. They shall bring forth after their kind. So then do you keep going after them about species and say, okay, well, maybe... Because I remember one guy said, I gave a great definition of species. You know, those animals are able to reproduce. Sure, and I said, okay, dog and a wolf are different species. Well, then they can reproduce. Then they can reproduce. So, so where is your definition? You know, your, your definition breaks down. Yeah. You see, somehow they're all blinded. They think, you know... Give me a definition of kind, or else you don't know what, or else, or else I win the debate on evolution. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the original kinds were. Probably nobody does. Uh, yeah, I think for the vast majority, it's obvious. Okay, let's put a dog and a banana. Now those are different kinds. Okay, dog and a wolf, mm, same kind. Dog and a uh, hyena, I don't know. You know, dog and a fox. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how many original kinds of dog-type animals there were. And today we have, you know, hundreds, but there may have been originally five, just to pick a number. Or cat. Is a house cat and a tiger and a mountain lion and a, uh, li uh, you know, are they, all from the, are they from the original ancestors in the garden? I don't know. God might have made three kinds of cats, and now we have 800 species. Or he might have made one kind of cat. I don't know. But I know if you put all the animals back in the basic kinds, there's only about 8,000 kinds of animals that have been classified. Now, there's who knows how many million species because some guy gets the idea that he wants to call something a different species, but it's the same kind. All right. So Darwin noticed all these finches and said, I believe all these finches had a common ancestor. Now, you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> but then he wrote in his book on page 170, Charlie said... It is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Now, would you say that is a logical conclusion to draw from seeing 14 varieties of birds? No. no that is a stretch. Okay? If you flip a coin three times and get heads every time, and you conclude, wow, this is going to be heads from now on the rest of my life, well, I don't think so, okay? <laughs> That's quite a stretch. Darwin really went overboard on this one. What he observed is called microevolution. Now, I don't like that word. I think the word should be stricken from the dictionary. It's a lousy phrase, okay? However, we're stuck with it because that's what they're going to use, okay? You need to understand it, and then I think you need to avoid it because it's not really a good term because it implies evolution. We ought to just call it a variation, because that's what it is. Probably the 250 varieties of dogs had a common ancestor, a dog. And probably the roses. You know, the original rose only had five petals. The real, wild, original rose has only got five petals. Looks kind of like a daisy. Uh, I guess I read a botany book where they were talking about the history of the rose, and some guy got a mutant rose a mutation, where instead of the petals sticking out, they were curled up, and there was more of them. And he thought it looked neat. 
So he did whatever he did before and kept getting this mutant and finally crossbred them and they happened to be fertile and he ended up, now we have roses all over the world that are from this original mutation. But normally, that mutation would have bred right back into the... Unless somebody had, unless somebody had been there working with it, right. it, would, it wouldn't have survived. Right. Natural selection would not have produced... Rose. Probably not, no. Artificial selection did. And now, if you turn them all loose back into the woods... I suspect within a hundred years they would go back. Unless, unless the original genes are, are gone. They got same data, but it's... Right, rearranged data. For instance, if I gave you 500 chihuahuas and says, here, I want you to go out in this deserted island and I want you to crossbreed these dogs until you come back with a Great Dane. Well, you're probably not going to be able to do that, okay? You might end up with a bigger chihuahua, still just as useless as the small one, but... <laughs> You're not going to get a Great Dane because the genes for, for that big a dog are just simply gone. It's not available. Okay? If you got all the pygmies and said, okay, we're going to crossbreed these pygmies until we get you know, somebody seven feet tall, well, it's probably not going to happen. There probably isn't. Yeah, maybe you might get one five or six feet, but you know, there's going to be. The limit is different from the gene pool, from the information that's available. Okay. Microevolution is certainly observable. You can make it happen. This is what farmers do for a living. Over all the years and years and years of breeding cows, they have learned certain cows have certain traits that are desirable for a certain product, okay? If you want a cow that gives the best milk in the world, my understanding of cows is that you get a, a Guernsey. The problem is Guernseys don't give very much milk. Now, other kinds of cows will give an awful lot. We, in Illinois, we saw the cow that at that time was the world record holder giving a hundred and some pounds of milk every day. 100 pounds of milk every day. Yeah. All they do is eat all day, and then they milk them twice a day, you know. And the rest of the day they're eating. But uh, now the, uh, the Angus is really good beef. That's supposed to be one of the best eating cows, apparently, or one of the top ones, the Angus. The Brahma is, is the one that got the big hump on his back. That one can stand the heat really well. The Brahma came from down Mexico, Central American countries, you know, and it was able to tolerate the heat, whereas the Angus was able to give the best beef. Brahma's not as good eaten, but it stands the heat better. Angus is better beef, but it doesn't stand the heat very well. And so they cross them and get a Brangus, which is both, but only for that one generation. So the farmer will have a whole herd of Angus cows and one Brahma bull, and then he takes the generation they produce and sells them. If he tried to raise them to produce the next generation, he would, he would lose it. Why, would you, you, they, why couldn't you breed a Brangus and a Brangus? I guess it starts blending back to one trade or the other. You know, this is the type of stuff you study, and I didn't, I didn't take classes on that. You know, on uh, farming, okay, uh, husbandry. It'll start to lose some of the traits, right? So when uh, a Norwegian and a Russian marry, you got the two supreme races, you know, that uh, they ought to produce really good kids if they ever would. Right, son? Uh, okay. <laughs> Tell him, brother. See? Okay. Um, so the microevolution is observable. It is scientific. It is scriptural. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. Probably Chihuahua and Great Dane came from a common ancestor, even though they look extremely different. And if all you found were the bones in the ground and you'd never seen a live animal, you probably would never put them as the same kind. What do you mean? Put them the if nobody had ever seen a live dog and you found bones of Chihuahuas and bones of Great Danes, uh -oh. you would not imagine that's the same kind of animal. If all you found was a fossil caterpillar and a fossil butterfly, yeah. you would never dream it's the same animal, right? right. But it is. There are lots of fossils like that, They're like the dinosaurs. There's no telling how many are actually the same kind. There are many, for instance, there's what's called sexual dimorphism, where the male and the female are very different, even in their, you know, uh, uh, skeletal structure. For instance, if you look at sea lions, the male is huge and the female is always real tiny. So, and if you look at black widow spiders, the female is huge and the male is real tiny. You would never put those two together. As, if all you found, you know, were uh, fossils of them, you probably would have them as a different species. So that's why today there are seven or eight hundred different kinds or varieties of dinosaurs in the dinosaur books for kids, and they got all these big names to learn. There's probably only about 30 different kinds of dinosaurs. 
but there's all these variations. Who would ever put a... Uh, well, some animals, as they grow, they go through totally different stages. Caterpillar, butterfly. Others, like a, grass, a baby grasshopper, looks like a big grasshopper, just smaller. Whereas a baby butterfly looks like a worm. Same thing with a fly. It's a maggot. Then it becomes a fly, okay? Some go through several of these stages. Yeah, a tadpole, then it's got two legs, then it's got four legs and a tail, and then it's got four legs and no tail. Do they ever try to use that sort of Some do. I was wondering, you know, why don't they use caterpillar to butterfly? Oh, I have almost all the time in debates, they'll say, caterpillar to a butterfly is evolution. I say, no, it's driven, this is directed by a very complex code. The, you know, the caterpillar isn't doing this on his own. I mean, it, it spins a cocoon, turns to jelly inside, and reforms with wings that can fly away. Explain that to him. Yeah, how did that evolve? For millions of years, none of them survived. You know, they got to the cocoon stage and died. You know, turned to jelly and something made them. You know, none of them survived. Can't reproduce till the butterflies. Right. right, can't reproduce till the butterflies. Oh, wow. I mean, when you study stuff like this, you say, God, you've got to be so smart. And you put so many things down here just to make it look obvious that it couldn't evolve, and yet people still believe it anyway. Is it true that caterpillars have to be alive 17 years? There's all sorts of varieties. Some are only in the caterpillar stage for a few months, turn to a butterfly or a moth or whatever. Uh, some are 17 years. That, that is an entire study in itself that you could spend a lifetime on, and it's a very interesting stuff. Okay. Dog, wolf, and coyote probably had a common ancestor, but a three-year-old can tell you it's the same kind of animal. When I do a churches now, I'll say, okay, I got some animals up here on the screen. How, how many kids are five and under? Raise your hand. By then, the parents got to wake them up, you know, hey, wake up, kid, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, boys and girls, now, let's see who can be the first one to tell me the answer to this one. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? And I get some five-year-old to raise their hand, and, and I'll make everybody clap. Yeah, hey, hey, Johnny got it here, you know. It's obvious. And yet, somehow, they don't see it. If Charlie wants to believe a dog and a banana have a common ancestor, I don't care what Charlie believes. But that's not science. That's his religion. And I still am over 50. In the 50 debates I've done, I have never gotten an evolutionist to admit that evolution is religion. I've come close. Have you? But I mean, once they realize what they're about to say, they stop. They, stop. they can't say that, you know, right? <laughs> but it is. See, because once they admit it's a religion, then they're going to say, well, then we shouldn't be teaching this in school, should we? It's precisely my point. Welcome to our side. <laughs> Okay, we're going to quit here and take a break in a second, but in Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in the Bible, ten times the phrase appears, after his kind. That'll be a quiz question. Genesis chapter 1, the phrase, after its kind, or after his kind, or after their kind, that phrase appears ten times, in only 31 verses. I think God wanted us to get the message, after the kind. And many people get into debates with evolutionists and they get themselves in trouble because they start arguing about species. And they're doing exactly what Darwin's contemporaries were doing, and they don't even realize it. They're falling into the trap of saying species never change. Well, yes, species do change. But kinds don't. Same kind. For one thing, who's making up, who decides what's a new species anyway? People say, all scientists believe in evolution. I say, oh, really? Who decides who's a scientist? Speaking of spiders, we've got one there. Okay, let's take a little break. When we come back, we'll finish up uh, part four. Well, let's uh, continue now with what the textbooks teach versus what the Bible teaches versus what Charles Darwin teaches about uh, evolution. The Bible says uh, several times, actually ten times in the first chapter in the book of Genesis, that the animals and plants will bring forth after his kind. Notice the use of the word kind, after his kind. See, the problem is, this word evolution has at least six different meanings, or six different levels, or phases, or steps, whatever you want to call it. The first one would be cosmic evolution. That's the Big Bang. We talked about that in an earlier session. And then there's chemical evolution, and then stellar evolution, and then organic evolution. That's the origin of matter. And then macroevolution. Now, the last one is called microevolution. I object to the term. Okay, I don't think mac microevolution is a good term, but we're stuck with it. Okay, everybody uses the term microevolution, so let's just define this now and show you that it, it 
microevolution happens, but it should just be called a variation within the kind, exactly like the Bible says. Macroevolution is what does not happen. And some professors are always trying to give me a hard time saying, well, just exactly where is the line between micro and macro? Well, I don't know exactly where the line is in all cases, but it's obvious there is a line. See, evolution is a religious worldview when you get above microevolution. Nobody's ever observed any macroevolution. Evolution is a religion because its followers believe that it can violate the laws of thermodynamics, the first and second laws. They ascribe to evolution this mystical uh, force that they call evolution. They give it the same power that we give to God. Evolution knows what it wants, or evolution directs things to happen, or evolution can overcome the laws that we see in nature, like the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So it gives evolution, which is its God, actually, the power to create the universe and to create life. Evolution calls for faith in all sorts of things. You have to believe matter created itself. You have to believe matter can come to life and then learn to reproduce and then change from one kind to another. All of that stuff is purely taken on faith. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Thirdly, members who no longer believe in evolution will be excommunicated. I mean, if you stop believing this theory, you will lose your job. And there are many professors and teachers in school who have become critical of evolution theory and have lost their job. It just is, it's discrimination. It happens all across the country, though. Fourthly, only members in good standing, then, are considered worthy of judgment. And therefore, if you don't believe in evolution, you're not worthy of judgment. So all those worthy of judgment believe in evolution. <laughs> Sounds like Soviet style to me. A teacher gets up in the Soviet Union 10 years ago and says, kids, I don't believe in communism anymore. Well, he's going to lose his job or, or his life. And then they can survey all the teachers and say, how many believe in communism? And, of course, they all raise their hand. And they'll say, see, kids, all the teachers believe in communism. Therefore, it must be true. That's a Russian-style ballot, what we've got here in America, when it comes to evolution. Because if a teacher stands up against the evolution theory, they are likely to lose their job or their, certainly their government grants. Their financing will dry up. Ask Robert Gentry what happened to him at Oak Ridge Laboratories when he started publishing information against uh, the evolution theory. Evolution tries to answer the basic questions to life, like who are we, why are we here, where did we come from, where are we going when we die. It, it does the same thing any other religion does. It answers the four basic questions to life. And evolution is often deified. If you look in literature dealing with the subject, you'll see the word evolution is capitalized, as if it is God of some kind, and it's certainly not. Evolutionists like to focus the discussion on microevolution because that's all there are is examples from microevolution. There are thousands of examples of that. You know, dogs produce a variety of dogs, and they'll say, see, evolution happens. No, microevolution happens. Variations happen, but that doesn't extend any farther than that. And they keep focusing on examples from microevolution because they want to draw the attention away from the fact that there is no evidence for any of the rest of them. They are all pure religion. So I get all sorts of letters and phone calls and emails from folks that are upset with me because I try to include the other five in with evolution theory. And they'll say, well, evolution doesn't deal with the origin of life. Evolution doesn't deal with the Big Bang. Okay, if that's really what you mean, then why don't you help me get that stuff out of the textbooks? See, they don't want to help get it out of the textbooks. They like it in there because it kind of helps, you know, uh, foster what they believe. But it's certainly not part of science. Okay, the textbooks teach 20 billion years ago there was a Big Bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. And then about 4.6 billion years ago the Earth cooled down, developed a hard rocky crust, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup. This textbook says, as the earth formed, the surface was hot like the moon, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. And then it rained on the rocks and formed the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals, this textbook says. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. But they believe non-living material came alive about three billion years ago. This textbook says, uh, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Now, here we have systems that are able to replicate, in other words, reproduce themselves. And they say, well, it must have emerged. You've got to watch that word emerged. It occurs all through the textbook. It means nothing. They'll say, man emerged on the African continent. What do you mean, emerged? Oozed out of a rock or something? How did this happen? That's not science to say self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. That is meaningless. So they teach, you know, life appeared in the rocks about from the soup about three billion years ago. And I oftentimes they'll, they'll you know, they'll say, 
uh, do you think all the dogs could come from two dogs on Noah's Ark? And I say, well, do you believe all the dogs in the world came from a rock? <laughs> which is precisely what they believe. See, jumping from microevolution, which is observable, to macroevolution takes a giant leap of faith and logic. Nobody's ever seen any of this happen at all. There's a variety of dogs, and they might have had a common ancestor, and it was a dog. Macroevolution is imagination. It's based on imagination. It's a fantasy. It didn't happen. But they try to always argue, where's the line between micro and macro? I don't know. In every case, I mean, in some cases it's obvious, but and I think maybe discovering where the line is is a good field of research for science. But to give examples of micro and therefore assume that all the rest go together is not a good pursuit for science. That is a pursuit for uh, religionists, those who want to believe in evolution. That's perfectly fine. So the teachers give the kids examples of one and try to make them believe in the other. In, advertise, in advertising, it is called bait and switch. If I ran an ad in the paper that said, new Mercedes, $10, how many of you would line up to come get the car? Everybody, right? Suppose when you arrived at the door, I said, well, you know, it's actually uh, 99000 We sold the $10 one. Well, no, no, hold it. If I run an ad, <clears throat> new Mercedes, $10, I better have a new Mercedes for $10. If I don't, it's, it's illegal. It's called bait-and-switch advertising. I baited you to get you to come into the store, and then I switched it on you for something else. People go to jail for this bait-and-switch advertising. But that's exactly what's happening in the textbook. So students are given one example, uh, one definition of the word evolution, and then once they get them to believe in it by giving them examples of microevolution, they will switch it to try to include all the rest of them. And by then, the kid is hooked and doesn't realize he has been brainwashed. Look at this textbook. It says, evolution is change over time. Ooh, now there's one definition. Now watch how they narrow it down, though. Down here in the center part, it says, in other words, there is no doubt that living things have changed over time. Ooh, now we're clear down to part five of our six parts of evolution. They've already bypassed Big Bang. They've already bypassed the stellar evolution, the chemical evolution, the origin of life. Now they're just saying living things have changed over time. Well, what happened to the first four? See, they switched it on them. Then you go to the, another page here, and it says, evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Well, now they've narrowed it down again. Now they're changing within the species. Well, I agree with that. See, they're giving a definition of evolution, but they keep changing the definition. If evolution is really a change in species over time, then let's get the Big Bang out of the textbook. And let's get origin of life out of the textbook, because that's not part of this. That's how they bait and switch the kids every time. Students are given examples from microevolution, and then the real meaning is slipped in, like they try to talk about cosmic evolution and organic evolution. And then they have the gall to tell the students, if you don't believe in evolution, you don't understand science. They get, I get this all the time. They'll say, oh, but you don't understand science. I think I do understand science. Science means knowledge, things that we know, we can observe, we can test, we can demonstrate. Evolution is none of those. It's not knowledge, it's belief. And if you want to believe it, fine. Just don't call it science, that's all. See, we observe lots of variations, and variations certainly happen, but they have limits. Haven't the farmers been trying to get bigger pigs? Doesn't every farmer want to breed the biggest pig he can get, if assuming he's raising the pigs for, for sale? Okay, do you think there's a limit to the size? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? No, I bet there's a limit in there somewhere, right? I'm not sure exactly where the limit is, but it's somewhere less than the size of Texas and maybe a little bigger than they are now. I don't know if you get a 1,000-pound hog or not, but uh, you might get a 1,200-pounder someday or 1,400-pounder, but you never get a 4-billion-ton hog. Okay, there's a limit. Variations happen, but there are limits. And the farther you get from the norm, the more problems you have, the more you've got to babysit the thing. If you turn them 1,000-pound hogs loose back in the woods, they won't survive. Nature would select against them surviving. There's an optimum size for different climates. Natural selection works, but it has nothing to do with evolution. Uh, roaches eventually become resistant to pesticides. You spray pesticides on a bunch of roaches, and 99.99% of them die. Well, the 0.01% that lives is going to then produce the next generation of roaches, obviously. And now, out of those kids, maybe half of them die from the pesticide because half of them inherited a resistance. Okay. That happens. And then eventually you can get a whole population of roaches that are resistant to a particular pesticide. 
okay, it's still a roach. And the variation, the, the information for the variation was already in the gene pool. See, roaches might become resistant to pesticides, but they never become resistant to a sledgehammer. There's a limit to the resistance. And they produce the same kind of plant or animal. Variations are still the same kind. When you get into a discussion on evolution, I recommend you don't use the word species. Stick with the word kind. The biblical kind were those that originally were able to reproduce and produce a viable offspring. Uh, at the, uh, one of the aquariums, they have the, uh, the walpin, a cross between a killer whale and a dolphin. Well, I don't know if a killer whale and a dolphin came from the same kind or not. They might have originally been one kind of animal that diversified into killer whales and dolphins. I don't know. They certainly are interfertile under special conditions. So I'm not, I don't know exactly where the line is in every case between what is a kind. And that would be a good field for research. But the fact that we don't know where the line is doesn't mean there isn't a line. And it doesn't mean the biblical definition is not, uh, is not correct. Those that originally were able to reproduce after their kind. See, uh, <clears throat> the information for the variation has to already be present in the gene pool. Maybe you heard about the guys that were trying to find the Northwest Passage across uh, Canada to get to, you know, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Turns out there isn't one, but they were looking for it. And they f some of the guys got caught up in there and froze. Well, they dug up the bodies and found out these guys were resistant to penicillin. Well, penicillin hadn't been invented yet. So the resistance to penicillin is already in the gene code someplace. And some people have it, some don't. Like some people can roll their tongue and some can't. I can't, okay? That's just something that's in the gene code. And it's not something that's added or taken away. It's just you can select for that. If you killed everybody that couldn't roll their tongue every 20 years, you killed everybody that couldn't roll their tongue, eventually you'd get a whole population of tongue rollers. Okay, they're still people. That's not evolution. That's variation. Now, the gene pool of the new variety is always more limited. Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop the Chihuahua. Imagine that. All that work to make a dog that is 100% useless. Turn all the Chihuahuas loose back into the woods and tell me how long they'll last. They'd run up to the wolf. Yep, 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 yep. Crunch. <laughs> End of gene pool. They wouldn't survive. You have to babysit them. You've got to protect them because they can't protect themselves. So that is an example of uh, artificial selection where man selected a particular trait and kept selecting and selecting and ended up with a Great Dane or a Chihuahua or whatever. That's natural. That's artificial selection. And it works with some pretty wild varieties. But they're still a dog. They still have the genes for dog. And they're still interfertile. Um, Genetic information is always lost, not added, when you get a variation like that that is selected, either by artificial or natural selection. Some information is lost. I come from Illinois, corn country. They have so many kinds of corn up there, they have to number them. You drive down the highway and you'll see, you know, BX65, don't mix it up with XL29, something will blow up. But you can crossbreed your corn from now to the cows come home, and you always get corn. You'll never get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on that corn stalk. It's not going to happen. See, variations happen within the kind, and that's all we ever observe. There's a variety of dogs, and they might have had a common ancestor. It was a dog. It could be that the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue with that. But it looks like a horse. I mean, stand back and look at it. Okay, it's the same kind of animal. There's varieties of cows, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a cow. There are all kinds of varieties, but that, that, they're limited at that. Okay, and you have to stress that. If somebody says, we've got evidence for evolution, they'll always give you an example of microevolution. Always. Never anything beyond that. No animal changing from one kind into another. See, what happened, Lyle, or Hutton, I'm sorry, J Hutton wrote his book in the late 1700s, 1795, and that book began to take away the idea of a 6,000-year Earth. People began to believe the Earth is millions of years old or at least, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old in 18, uh, 1795. And then along came Charlie Lyell and wrote this book, Principles of Geology, and he took away the flood. After people read this book, they said, wow, maybe those layers weren't formed by a flood. Maybe they're formed by, you know, millions of years of slow accumulation. And this book really changed people's worldview. And then along came Charlie Darwin and wrote this book, The Origin of Species, and he took away the Creator. Everybody started thinking, well, you know, maybe we got here without a creator. 
Maybe evolution is how it happened. And boy, people's worldview was changed. And those three false teachings are still in textbooks today. They're still teaching the earth is millions of years old. They're still teaching today's processes created the earth and created the canyons and all the features we see. And it, it, it avoids the obvious use of catastrophes to create these things. And they're still teaching evolution occurs. That stuff's in textbooks right now in your county and my county. The Bible warned us about science that is falsely so-called. Now, I like science, and I've got tons of science books. But science that is falsely so-called, that's where evolution fits in. It is called science, but it should not be called science. It's actually a religious worldview. There is no scientific evidence to back it up. And even Christians that go to college and learn this stuff have their faith destroyed. This uh, professor said, uh, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. And that professor now teaches at Harvard University and destroys the faith of thousands of other kids who come through his class. Because he went off to school unprepared to handle the evolution philosophy that was going to be crammed down his throat, and he believed it. Especially at 17, you've got to figure the hormones develop faster than the brain. Satan knows to get the kids the first couple years of college because they kind of like an idea to get away from God anyway, you know, and the restrictions of the Christian fundamentalist religion. You know, thou shalt not commit adultery and stealing and lying and all these kind of stuff. And you know, all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's pretty nice to not have a God telling you what to do. Especially in a prosperous country like America, nobody wants, you know, restrictions on their lifestyle because there's so many opportunities to sin. And as, you know, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. That, that season will come to an end, and then you got to reap what you sow. Uh, do you know 75% of all the kids that go from Christian homes to secular universities, public schools, and universities will lose their faith after one year of college? I remember my freshman year at Illinois Central College. I had teachers who thought it was their duty in life to destroy my faith as a Christian. And it was a trial and a struggle. And if you go to a secular college, I guarantee you'll have at least one probably several, but you'll have some teachers who just think it's their, it's their duty in life to ruin your faith. And they've got all their pet questions they'll ask you, you know, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it, and all this kind of stuff, you know, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? And all these questions have been answered years ago, but they'll, they'll bring them up to the freshman who doesn't have an answer, and the kid goes home and, you know, starts to lose his confidence in God's Word. And then, of course, he's away from home, and he's got the peer pressure of his friends who are do drinking and, you know, have premarital sex and all this kind of stuff, and it just uh, it, it destroys a large percentage of them. Now, as much as I like science, and there's an awful lot of good science in these books, there's some poison in there. Kids love to learn. I mean, that's normal. I think it's a God-given trait where people want to learn. I like to learn things, okay? But what are we teaching them anyway? Everybody tries to convert others to believe like they believe. I'm working to get, you to, con to get you converted to believe like I believe. I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. I believe we're going to be judged one day before God. And you better get right with God or you're going to hell if you're not saved. And if you are saved, you better keep your heart right with God or you're going to be punished by your Heavenly Father. I believe the Bible teaches that, okay? So I believe that. And I'm trying to convert you. The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But it would not be right for me to try to convert you to my belief and lie to you in order to change your mind. That would be wrong. That would be criminal. What's happening in our textbooks, some people want the kids to believe in evolution theory, but they lie to them to get them to believe the theory. You know, if I told you 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, you people would say, wait a minute, where's your evidence for this? If I said 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, Somebody's going to say, hey, where's the evidence for this? If I said life come from non-living material, where's the evidence? You have to give the kids some evidence. You've got to make them believe. What evidence do they give for evolution theory? Well, let's talk about a few of these things here. Students are taught, here's a typical chapter from a, a textbook. It says, we have evidence of evolution from fossils. We have evidence, evidence from structure, evidence from molecular biology. We, how we determine the age of fossils. We have evidence from development. This is what they show the kids. They're going to try to present them some evidence. Now, we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at the evidence that is presented and how it doesn't really hold up to scientific inquiry. It's outdated, false information. It's been proven wrong a long time ago, but they still keep it in the books today to try to get the, get the kids to believe in this silly theory. Then they tell the kids the theory of evolution... Um, 
is based upon natural selection. Now, let's just discuss all this here. Evolution theory is basically based upon two faulty assumptions. Number one, they assume that a mutation will make something new. And then number two, they assume that natural selection will make the good one survive and take over the whole population. See, in order for evolution to work, one animal has to get a little better than the rest of them, and the rest of them have to die. I mean, evolution is suffering and death and cruelty. Not at all the way God would make things. Not the God that I would want to worship anyway. People say, couldn't God use evolution? Well, I'm sure he could, but he didn't, and he wouldn't. That's a stupid, retarded God that has to use evolution to get us here. If you believe God used evolution to get us here, you've got the wrong God. You ought to trade him in for the real one, the almighty, all-powerful God of the universe. You ought to trade that God in. So they're going to say, mutations will make something new. Well, let's talk about this. Mutations certainly happen. This picture shows a bunch of roses. The textbook says, mutations are the original source of variation in populations. Okay, I agree. You know, the original rose only had five petals. It looked kind of like a daisy. And then, you know, the rose we have today is a mutant variety. Probably many folks wouldn't even recognize a real rose if they saw one. They've only seen the mutant roses. Somebody capitalized on this, you know, pretty-looking rose with all these petals curling up. And today we have all sorts of variations of roses. There's white ones and pink ones and yellow ones and red ones and, you know, multicolored ones and big ones and little ones and, you know, teacup roses and all this. But there's still a flower. That's not evolution. Yes, variations happen, and yes, mutations happen. But even people who believe in evolution, like Pierre Grasse will tell you, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. And again, you've got to define this word evolution. They don't produce any kind of macroevolution, none whatsoever. Here's a picture of a five-legged bull. He can't run any faster. Now, this bull is a mutant. He did not get any new information. The gene code to the bull already contains the information to make a leg. It just built one in the wrong place, that's all. It didn't give him a wing or a feather or a beak. It gave him an extra leg, so there's not new information, there is only scrambled information. Uh, some people write me letters and say, I've got proof for evolution, and they give an example of polyploidy, which is where uh, an, a, a plant, particularly, will double the number of chromosomes. And you end up with giant strawberries or giant fruit of some kind, because it's exactly double the number of chromosomes. That's not any new information. It's a copy of information that's already existing. That's not evolution. Nothing new has been added, and it's still a strawberry. No, I'm sorry, that is not evolution. And in nature, probably wouldn't survive. Not generation after generation, anyway. It wouldn't make it. Here's a picture of a short-legged sheep. Notice what the textbook says. This mutation would not last in nature. Well, of course not, man. He's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Go, boys, go. Here comes the wolf. <laughs> oh, Herman didn't make it. See, mutations happen, but they deal with information that's already present, and it diminishes the amount of information. The sheep already had a gene pool code to tell him how to make legs. It just made them shorter. It didn't give him wings. It didn't give him a beak. It didn't give him a bigger brain where he could think like a human. It gave him shorter legs, and he already had legs. That's, and that's supposed to be an example of evolution. Well, that's an example of a mutation. Certainly mutations happen, but that's where they, they stop. They don't do anything. Here's a two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. It's not ninja, just a mutant turtle. If you've seen the TV series about teenage mutant ninja turtles or something like that, uh, you'll appreciate that. But Two-headed turtle is a mutant, and it's not helpful. He's going to freeze first winter. Nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. They just aren't going to survive. Okay. A mutation is a scrambling of information that's already existing. I remember as a kid, every Christmas, we'd get together with the family, and we would have play games around the uh, uh, Christmas tree or around the stockings or something. And we would say, who can make up the most words from the word Christmas? And you pick out the letters and rearrange them, and you can get, you know, has, Matt, Sam, Christ, uh, Ram, uh, all sorts of, probably hundreds of words can be obtained from just scrambling the letters that are already existing in the word Christmas. But you're never going to get Xerox, or Zebra, or Queen. The letters aren't available. And that's what a mutation does. A mutation will scramble information that's already existing, but it's not going to give you any new information. It doesn't create anything new. It just scrambles what you had. It's not going to help at all for evolution. This textbook shows a picture of a mutant fly. 
Now look carefully what they said here. Normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, now hold on a second. Why would they show us a harmful mutation and then tell us that beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection? Why didn't they show us a beneficial mutation? You know why they didn't show a beneficial mutation? Because nobody's ever seen one. There are no beneficial mutations. They don't exist. One guy said, we've got beneficial mutations because uh, uh, sickle cell anemia is a beneficial mutation. If you get sickle cell anemia in Africa, then you can't get malaria. Oh. Well, that's probably true, okay? But you can die from malaria or you can die from sickle cell anemia. So to say that sickle cell anemia is a beneficial mutation because you can't get malaria is like saying, if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. Well, that's true, but uh, you need your legs, okay? That's not a beneficial mutation. And if that's the best example you've got for a mutation causing some, being something beneficial, you're, you're in sad shape if you're trying to prove you, we all came from a rock. If that's the best example you can give is the sickle cell example, you're, you got a problem, okay? You got a silly philosophy. You ought to change what you believe, okay? This textbook says evolution and natural selection go together. Whole chapter on it. It says natural selection causes evolution. Well, now hold it. Natural selection certainly happens. We have no argument with that. The creation is thought of it first. Natural selection is what is called a conservative process. It doesn't create anything new. It conserves the species or kind as it is. Natural selection weeds out the inferiors and keeps defective organisms from taking over the population. Natural selection works. I got no argument with that. It has nothing to do with evolution, though. It's not going to cause any new kind of animal. This uh, textbook says, natural selection can only act on biologic properties that already exist. It cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. There have been many times when I needed a third arm when I was building a house. It'd be nice to hold the board and hold the hammer and now how do I get the nail out? Okay? But just because I, I feel the need for one, it's not going to create one. It'd be nice to have wings. Many times I wish I had wings. I could fly someplace, get there faster, get out of a traffic jam. But the fact that I feel this need for them is not going to create them. And it'd be nice to have an eye in the back of your head to see the kids when they're playing when you're busy working. Okay, that'd be nice. A lot of moms would wish they had an eye in the back of the head. But needing one and feeling the need for it very strongly is not going to create it. It has to be in the genetic information. See, natural selection is sort of like a quality control. If you worked in a factory that produced cars, I worked at General Motors, okay? And when I worked there at General Motors, we built trucks. GM Truck and Coach Plant, Pontiac, Michigan. Plant number six. If, I, if I'm working on the assembly line, building these trucks, and when they get to the end of the assembly line, somebody checks them. You know, kick the tire, slam the door, make sure it starts, drive it around, and look for defects. That's normal. Almost any factory that produces any complex item has a quality control. Before it goes out the door, you check it. That's common sense. Suppose these trucks are going through, or suppose you, suppose you work in a fisher body, or you work in uh, General Motors or someplace, and you're building cars. And your job is to check every car that comes by and look for defects. If you find a defect, and it's very serious, you reject it. That's what natural selection does. The slowest rabbit's probably going to get caught by the fox or the wolf. So that keeps the species of rabbits fast. If all the slow ones survive, well, then pretty soon the whole population would slow down. Yeah, that would, have, that would happen. Sure, natural selection works. But it's still a rabbit. It doesn't change a thing. If you're working in this factory and your job is to check the cars coming out the line, and you take out every reject, how long would it take that process to change the car to an airplane? Oh, it never will. See, natural selection doesn't change the animal or plant to something else. And quality control doesn't change the car to an airplane design engineering changes the car to an airplane. Natural selection is God's quality control. That's all it is. And survival of the fittest certainly happens. Generally. It's not a really good word. Okay, a good phrase. Survival of the fittest certainly, though, does not explain arrival of the fittest. The fact that the fastest rabbits generally survive doesn't tell you how the rabbits came to be. 
Doesn't tell you, it doesn't help you at all explaining how the rabbits came to be. And survival of the fittest is what is often called a tautology. That is a sentence that means nothing. I'll show you how it works. Ask a professor, say, excuse me, sir, could you please tell me why this one survived? You say, well, because it's the fittest. Oh, uh, question. How do you know it's the fittest? Well, because it survived. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's why it's called a tautology. It's a useless phrase. Yes, I'll go along with probably generally the strongest survive, okay? But that has nothing to do with evolution whatsoever. If a whale goes through a school of fish and eats 80% of them, it's not survival of the fittest. It's called survival of the luckiest. And that's what really happens. Survival of the fittest, it's a useless phrase, okay? Probably because of natural pressures, the strongest in certain areas will survive, or the fastest, or the smartest, or whatever. But it doesn't change it to something else. It's still the same kind. And you have to keep that thought in mind. Okay, next week we'll take up where we left off, talking about uh, more about Charlie Darwin's book and some of the examples they give today in the textbooks for evolution, uh, and all of which have been proven wrong. And this is the kind of information that will help students that have to go to public school. We'll cover that next week.